Welcome to my Tech Talk with the Technical Information Scientist of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Ito, and my job as Technical Information Scientist is to serve research community by answering all most related research questions. And I am Dr. Brenda Kick. My Tech Talk is a way for us to connect with the research community and answer some of those most related questions live. Awesome. So hopefully you are ready with your questions because it's time for my Tech Talk. So today, let's talk caring for immunodeficient mice. Yes, the Jackson Laboratory receives a lot of questions surrounding immunodeficient mice care and clinical concerns. So I really hope today we can hit home on your most concerning questions. Great, and we have prepared a few discussion topics for your watching live. You can use the comment section of the video to tell us where you are viewing from and any immunodeficient mice related questions you have, we will try to answer those today. So I'm so pleased to have Dr. Brenda here for this show. Um, Dr. Brenda is a senior clinical veterinarian here at the Jackson Laboratory, and she has been working with mice for five years. So you guys really comes to the right place. Um, Dr. Brenda, regarding the immunodeficient mice, um, could you elaborate on what is immunodeficient mice? I know that some strain like NSG, they are considered as severely immunodeficient mice, but some strain, they may be partially immunodeficient. So what kind of immunodeficient mice are we focusing today? Yes, Yutong, you're right. We do have varying levels of immunodeficiency in the strains here at JAX. So some of our mice still have very a variety of functioning immune cells. The immune system components are broken down into the innate immune system, which is our complement system, macrophages, granulocytes, and natural killer cells. We also have the adaptive immune system, which is comprised of the B and T lymphocytes as well as dendritic cells. A strain that is immunodeficient, but not at the extreme end, would be the nude mice that are homozygous for the Fox N1 mutation. So they lack T cells and cell mediated immunity, which results in deficiencies in B cell development as well. However, they still have their innate immune system fully functional. One of the most extreme immunodeficient mice would be the NSG, which is NOD skid gamma. And these are NOD mice that carry mutations in the skid and X linked IL2 receptor comic common gamma chain genes, they had significant deficiencies in both their innate and adaptive immune systems. And then the NRG, the non-RAG gamma, is similar in being severely immunodeficient in both innate and adaptive immune systems. So I would say that both of these latter two strains are what we mainly focus on in our talk today. Awesome. That's very great to know. And um, in TIS, uh, one of the most common questions that we get all the time is, I got this immunodeficient mice, how should I host them? So Dr. Brenda, could you quickly comment on that? So first you really need to know the immune status of the mouse that you have. Are they severely immunocompromised? Are they partially immunocompromised? Different mice have different needs. We can share some information on how we house the mice, but I really encourage you to have this conversation with your facility veterinarian, a facility manager, or the iCook team, because they will know your facility and iCook protocols better than we would. Yeah, I agree. So different facilities have different procedures and protocols. So something that works for us may not work for your facility. So definitely consult with those personnel. Um, Dr. Brenda, what are the most important things that you think when working with immunodeficient mice? Well, the most important thing I think of is biosecurity. If you've ordered a Jack's mice before, you may notice that most of the mice are coming from three different barrier levels. We have standard, high, and maximum barriers. We house all of our immunodeficient mice in the maximum barrier level rooms. What this means is that we either go through a wet shower or an air shower, and we cover our skin from head to toe in completely um, new, clean facility-designated clothing. We have facility-designated shoes. We wear N95 masks with face shields, or we wear a uh, papper, which is an air hat. And we always have gloves on our hands. Handling our mice, we only touch them with disinfected forceps. Cages should be changed under a laminar flow hood. Gloved hands should be disinfected anytime we open the cage lid, reach within the cage, or we remove our gloved hands from the hood. It's also important to disinfect the hood between cages. We also um, ensure to keep the bile burden low in the room by cleaning our floors, walls, and ceilings on a regular basis. 
The last thing is that all materials that come into the room are either sterilized or disinfected. Right. Um, as those mice will be all housed in the maximum barrier rooms, so we're only going to house them in sterilized individual ventilated cages. And at Jax, the drinking water is from a local source, uh, reverse osmosis filtered and acidified um, to pH 2.5 to 3 and autoclaved before it enters the room. So we found that it's a great way to control pseudomonas species contamination. And we autoclave food, um, water bottle, cage. Um, those cage bedding is steam line sterilized. So anything that comes in contact with the mice are all sterilized or disinfected. And another big factor is restricted entry. So you may aware that here at Jax, we are very careful about who can get in and out of our animal rooms. So this is extremely important because you do not want an undergraduate or summer student that gets very excited about the opportunity of working with animals, bring their families and friends to show them around the colony rooms and how interesting their work is. So you really need to restrict entry to those people who had proper training and also understand the importance of using appropriate PPE. So I really encourage you to think about the biosecurity procedures in your facility and ways to improve it. So given that street barrier housing, um, Dr. Brenda, what are the most common health conditions that those mice may develop? Well, if we maintain that strict barrier housing, some common clinical conditions that develop are going to be different tumor types. For our Balbsi skid strains, they develop thymic lymphomas at an early age, around eight to nine months of age. The NSG mice are resistant to thymic lymphomas, but they do develop osteosarcomas and mammary adenocarcinomas at a lower rate later in life. These mice are able to live up to 60 months of age. If strict barrier housing is not maintained, then how, um, some common health conditions that are gonna develop are gonna be systemic bacterial or viral infections. So if mice have these types of infections, they're going to display generalized ill appearance. And this is going to be lethargy, dehydration, hunched posture, and ruffled hair coat. Mice with this appearance, I highly suggest performing a full necropsy for blood culture, liver and or other tissue cultures, and PCR of common pathogens of concern that can be found on the webinar resource posted. Please note that even under strict hygienic practices, you may still see a low level of systemic infection in NSG or NRG mice, as they are even susceptible to their own bacterial flora. Right. So sounds like in order to keep those immunodeficient mice healthy, you really need to maintain them in a very strict barrier. Um, so if you see any health issues, I would highly encourage you to let your facility vet involved as soon as possible, because as Brenda said, um, sometimes further investigations may be need, such as cultural and histopathology, um, to rule out um, infection and to determine underlying causes. Um, Dr. Brenda, um, do we treat those mice in our facility? So no, Yatang, we do not treat mice in our facility. If they have any spontaneous tumors develop, we consider that endpoint for those mice. We also do not treat mice showing general signs of illness as we prefer to necropsy mice in this condition to ensure our colony is still clean and we didn't have any breaks in our barrier. Awesome. Um, I can see here, uh, hi, Caitlin. Um, it looks like we have... Uh, 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 like audience calling from Bahabur, and thank you for joining us. Uh, looks like we have a question coming in. Um, so, uh, can we house immunodeficient uh, competent mice with immunodeficient mice together? Uh, Dr. Brenda, could you quickly comment on that? So, if we house immunocompetent mice with immunodeficient mice, it really depends on the barrier status. So, we were talking a lot today about the high levels in our mice are housed in maximum barrier facilities. So, in those types of facilities, we can house immunocompetent and immunodeficient mice together. It just what maximum would mean is that the mice, none of the mice could be positive for any bacteria are viruses that are susceptible to immunodeficient strains. So as long as your immunocompetent mice are free of those same pathogens or opportunists, you could house them together. And we do successfully house 
them together. Um, if your barrier level is a little bit lower and you know you may have some opportunistics, then uh, opportunists, sorry, then you probably can't house your immunocompetent mice with your immunodeficient mice. Awesome, awesome. That's very good to know. Um, and uh, another question comes in. Um, so what is the best practice for taking mice from the mouse room to stay a surgical suit or experiment room? Um, Dr. Brenda, could you quickly comment on that? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It's a very great question. So yes, there are gonna be common areas that you might have to take your mice too. The best thing would be to try to, um, you know, disinfect those common areas. And then when you're transferring them, I try to encourage people to transfer them in a secondary containment, something that, you know, either you put their home cage inside of a plastic container or maybe temporarily a plastic bag and something that can be disinfected on the outside. That way, when you get into the new room of concern, you know, you can disinfect the outside and you open them up into a clean environment. Um, the biggest concern is that you might be collecting pathogens along the way or bacteria or viruses along the way. So that's where that secondary containment comes in handy. Um, the other thing you got to be uh, mindful of is, is that surgery suite or experimental room shared with other places or other investigators that have immunocompetent mice. If so, highly encourage you to disinfect all surfaces that your mice will be touching. So that way you decrease the bio burden on those surfaces. So if it's um, an irradiator, so one common thing that NSG mice have performed on them is irradiation. So if it's an irradiator, you know, disinfect that equipment per manufacturer's protocol so that you can have your mouse in there in a clean environment. Awesome. That's very helpful, Brenda. Um, another question I can see here is, um, uh, what is the ideal Sentinel program for immunodeficient mice? So we house immunodeficient and immunocompetent mice within the same cage, and it really allows us to survey our colony more efficiently as our immunodeficient mice will become sick with pathogens that show no signs in immunocompetent mice and our immunocompetent mice are going to seroconvert so it will allow us to perform any mouse antibody tests. Great. Um, uh, we still have another question regarding enrichment. So um, do immunodeficient mice need additional enrichment or it's uh, strain dependent, I guess? Yes, enrichment is strain dependent. One thing we have found here at JAX is that the same enrichment does not necessarily equate to the same benefit to all of our strains. One thing of note here is our NSG strain, all of our, all of our breeders are provided with a nestlet and a biodome, which is a cardboard tunnel. And adding this enrichment to the cages has nearly eliminated whisker picking and barbering that we have seen in this strain. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, well, that's all we have time for the questions this week. Uh, we have linked a few resources in the video description. Um, Dr. Brenda, could you quickly comment on those? Yes, I can. We have added some really helpful resources for you to delve into this topic further. The first is a blog article on six strategies to successfully manage an immunodeficient colony. Then we also have attached a webinar which goes into more immunodeficient strains than we discussed today. And it includes lists of the common bacterial agents that you want to exclude from your barrier if you house NSG or energy mice. Then lastly, we have added a link to a description of our different barrier levels at JAX and what the differences entail. Awesome. And our next Mice Tech Talk is called Let's Talk Cancer Modeling with PDX Mice on December 1st. So we're looking forward to seeing you on LinkedIn and YouTube. This is Yitong saying stay healthy, stay safe, and stay excited about research.